Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 668. Today we're going to talk about Marvel Champions. This is a new game coming out in a couple of weeks from Fantasy Flight Games. As you can obviously tell, it's set in the Marvel Universe. And this is a one to four player living card game. So it's a cooperative living card game. There'll be expansions, I believe, coming out monthly to add new heroes and villains and all kinds of other types of things to the game. Now this game comes with five heroes and three villains in a variety of scenarios and difficulty levels and kind of whiz bang gadgets to play you know various scenarios in various different ways uh, let's jump down to the table and i'll show you how the game works i'm not going to give you kind of an exhaustive uh you know overdeal of the game and just kind of the basic core set of the rules and i'll talk a little bit about some of the different heroes and stuff like that some of the more like strategic kind of considerations and specifics when we get back to telling you what I think about the game. Okay, so I've kind of scattershot set up a variety of different decks of cards and things. And your play area over the, over the course of the game might look a little bit scattered and stuff like this. But let's kind of zoom in and focus on a couple of the key components of the game that players will be interacting with. Of course, you've got your decks of cards and some tokens and stuff like that for tracking various different things. You've got dials here for hit points. So right now I've got Jennifer Walters here set up as She-Hulk. You can see she's actually got a double-sided card here. Here's her hero side. There's her alter ego side, and she starts out with 15 hit points here. And then we've got the villain hit point tracker up here. It's a little bit bigger there, and this can go up uh, quite a bit because it's actually the hit points of the villain is very configurable based on the number of players. So here's 24, and you can see that I've set this up as if it was a two-player game because you can see the amount of hit points here is 12 per player. You can see that little icon there with the little human head. So a lot of things in the game are going to sort of dictate and sort of scale based on the number of players. So when you build a deck for a hero, and I should show you some of the other heroes here that this comes with. It comes with Black Panther. It also comes with Spider-Man. And it comes with Captain Marvel, as well as Iron Man. And like I said, you have the alter ego side here. So you can see Tony Stark on the alter ego side. And they give you different abilities and sort of utilities uh, based on what you're, what's happening in the game. You might switch back and forth there. Uh, so we've got Jennifer Walters here. They start on their alter ego side when you start the game. And then you're gonna have a deck of cards. Well, there's a few types of cards in the game that you're gonna put into the deck. So here we can see this is a She-Hulk card. And whenever you play She-Hulk, you're always gonna shuffle in all 15 of the She-Hulk cards. And these are very, I would say personal to that character. So if you know anything about She-Hulk, she's also a lawyer. So you can see this is an alter ego action. So when she's in this mode, then you can play this and it, well, it does some cool stuff. And so that is gonna work for that. And then we've got this one here. We've got a hero action. So when she decides to go crazy and kick some booty, then when she's in hero mode, then you'll be able to play uh, this focused rage card here. But you're also gonna have a variety of basic cards, these kind of gray cards. And any hero can take uh, these cards here. You have Haymaker. You can see this is an event. You can see it's got the cost up there. All these cards have a cost usually. And then they also have sort of a resource that they can spend. So all the cards that you have in your hand, you can discard to play for other cards. So if I wanted to play this Haymaker, I can discard these two cards here. You can see that has one sort of lightning bolt resource there and this one fist. Now usually the actual icon doesn't matter. It just it only matters the number of them, but certain abilities and things that are out there, and sometimes villains will throw a card out there that says, if you spend certain types of resource, then you can trigger this effect or turn this effect off. Uh, but if you're just trying to pay for a card, any of those usually works, and then you can play and put that card into play or play and discard it. Like this is an event, so you would just play. It says hero action, do an attack, deal three damage to the enemy. That's pretty simple. But we've got Nick Fury here who is an ally, and when you pay Nick Fury, pay for the cost of Nick Fury, it costs four, and then you'll put him into play. You can see he's got some stats there, thwart, attack, some abilities, and he's got his hit points there. So maybe Nick Fury goes out into play next to She-Hulk. And then there's also an aspect here. So here we've got another ally here, Tigra, and she is aggression. So I've chosen to choose the aggression aspect to mix with my She-Hulk cards and my basic cards. Whereas, let's say I was playing Black Panther here, and then we might have mixed in some of these protection cards here. So you choose one aspect 
for your hero. So if I wanted, I could make a Black Panther play with an aggression deck and have She-Hulk play with protection. And there's also uh, leadership and justice. So those, those are kind of the four sort of aspects that you're gonna kind of choose and make up. So you always take your 15 basic cards and then you have the rest of your 40 to 50 cards to mix in these cards. So you can have a 40 card deck up to a 50 card deck. Now the other thing that each of these heroes also has that comes with them are these sort of like obligations and little like personal sort of nemesis cards. So this obligation card is legal work because you know, the She-Hulk is trying to thwart whatever the main plot line is, but she's also got a life. So this card might come up actually out of the villain deck. If you look at this, on the back it's yellow. And the back of these hero cards, they're blue. So this is actually going to get mixed into sort of the event deck for the villain, and this might come up and cause Jennifer to, you know, do something she doesn't really want to do, but she's got to do. And there's other cards in that deck might might trigger like your arch enemy showing up and some other of these other cards. So each hero has their own little kind of like baggage that they sort of bring along in their kind of personal life that might get in the way of whatever, you know, kind of the doomsday thing that's happening. And speaking of those villain cards, here you can see I've set up Claw. And you can see we've got level one, level two, and level three. Now typically you just have to defeat level one and level two, but if you wanna play like an expert mode, you can do level two and level three that you have to defeat. And there's also some expert cards that you'll shuffle into uh, their deck. And each of the villains in a similar way has their own little deck of cards. So these are all the Claw cards that are gonna be shuffled into the villain deck. Of course, each hero will add their obligation card to that deck. And then you're going to have like kind of a side quest, side scheme thing that gets shuffled in. So this one is sort of like the suggested one for Claw, Masters of Evil. But there's a variety of different ones. There's more of these side schemes than there are uh, villains. Uh, for example, you have the Rhino villain here. And this is sort of like your starter tutorial a villain to go after, and I would recommend that. The basic rhino scenario is pretty easy, but once if you play the expert rhino or any of these other villains, then it gets a little bit more difficult. But you've also got a list, you know, very variety of side schemes. You've got some standard cards here. You can take a look here. We can see down there they've got standard. So you'll shuffle these in in every villain deck. And then if you want to play with that expert mode and go after level two and level three, you've got a handy, just three cards of expert that are just a giant pain. So if you play expert mode, you can shuffle those in. So that's kind of your general basic setup. And like I said, you're gonna be setting the hit points equal to whatever it tells you times the number of players. Now turns are very simple. The players are gonna take all of their turns. And on your turn, you play as many cards as you want. You, you have to, of course, pay for them, but some of these obviously you know, cost zero. So you play as many as you can. You can, at any point in your turn here, flip over your hero card. So I can flip over and, you know, be on the alter ego side and do something, or maybe I could activate, you know, the hero and then flip them over or whatever, but you can only do a flip once. And based on which side they're on, they're gonna give you different special abilities. So the main thing that all of these heroes have is when they're in alter ego mode, they can recover health and you're gonna get damage. So whenever you use one of these icons on the left, you sort of tap them and exhaust them and now you recover that much health. Now, if you're on the other side here, you have the ability to thwart, attack, and then defend. Now defend, you don't actually do on your turn. You do that when the villain attacks you. But if I wanted to like thwart the scheme or you know take some threat off a card, or if I wanted to attack the villain or some minion directly, I'll tap that and then do that much damage or that much thwart. And then that's basically it. So you're playing cards, you're using your hero here and other allies like I was showing you here, like Nick Fury. So you can tap him or maybe do some special abilities he's got. The allies usually always have these little dots underneath thwart and attack, and that means whenever they do that, they're immediately gonna take that much points of damage just from exhausting them. So they're sort of like a temporary use. You can use them a couple of times. They may get attacked directly. You, kinda, you might throw them in front of you to sort of defend, to absorb more damage. But anytime that you use these actions here, you may or may not take damage depending on that icon there. And then at the end of your turn, you're going to discard as many cards as you wish, and then you're gonna draw back up to your hand size. And this is gonna be different based on which side uh, you're on here. So you can see her hand size is four when she's in rage mode there, but her hand size actually goes up to six when she's in the alter ego mode. But 
based on which sort of side you're on, the villain's gonna behave differently as well. So that's something you gotta think about. And just one kind of cool, interesting concept here. If we look at Tony Stark, he's got a hand size of six, and he has a hand size of only one when he's in Iron Man mode. But if you read this, it says, you get plus one hand size for each tech upgrade you control to a maximum of seven. And that makes a lot of sense. While Tony Stark is Tony Stark, he's busy, he's inventing, he's doing things. When you turn him into Iron Man, he's only really as good as his suit is. So the more tech upgrades and things like that you get out, the more cards you're gonna be able to draw while you're Iron Man. So that's a pretty cool concept. So once you have drawn back up to your hand size, any cards that are exhausted are going to ready. So let's say, let's for argument's sake, she was on this side. Now we're gonna ready her and then she is going to be ready to defend. So if you get attacked, you can actually tap her and uh, be able to sort of absorb two damage in this case uh, to defend. But again, you're gonna be tapped at the start of your turn, so you're not gonna be able to use her when it comes to being actually your player turn, because you only exhaust at the end of the player turn, and then when the villain reacts, uh, you know you may get to exhaust her for that, but again, that's how that works. So how does the villain turn work? Well, the villain is a multi-step process. It's on the back here of the reference card. It's not too difficult, though. We'll kind of walk through it, but it's gonna basically react against all the players that are involved in different ways, depending, again, if they're in hero mode or if they're on their alter ego mode. Now, each villain comes with a main scheme, and over the course of the game, they're gonna start adding threat to that scheme. And if it gets to this number, which in this case is six times the number of players, so in a two-player game, if we get to 12, then this is gonna resolve, and then that may end the game, or you may go to the second sort of phase of their scheme, and eventually, when you get to the last one, if the players do not defeat and beat up the villain, by the time their main scheme is, then they have lost the game. So the first thing they're gonna do every villain face is add a certain number of threat just to the scheme, just dead, dead on. So in this one, it's plus one uh, per player, so in a two-player game, we'd automatically put two scheme on here, or two threat on here. Now, you may have other cards and things or other tokens that come into play that increase that number. And then the villain is either going to attack or scheme, and that's, again, based on each individual hero. So if it was coming to me first, and again, it goes basically starting by the start player, which at the end of the villain phase is gonna move, but let's say it comes to me first and I'm in Jennifer Walters mode, then Claw will scheme. If I'm in She-Hulk mode, then he's going to attack. So if it's hero mode, attack. If it's alter ego mode, then it's gonna scheme. And it's gonna do that for each hero in play. So let's say we had two heroes both in alter ego mode. Well, he's just gonna do two scheme, and then what happens when you scheme or attack, you're gonna flip over the top card here of their villain deck and look at the bottom corner, and that's it. And that's a little boost icon. You're gonna count those. Those go from zero to three, and you're gonna add that number to whatever they're doing. So in this case, this is gonna add one to that, and that's gonna be three scheme, so that's no good. That's a lot of, that's a lot of threat to put on there. And if it were to attack, in this case, Claw has zero attack, but he does two bonus cards. So we're gonna flip this over here, and let's say we just got these here, so we have nothing on that one, and then again, one on this one. So we just get one attack. And then he's going to attack uh, whichever hero he's drawing for at that moment. Now before you uh, reveal whatever the boost card is, or boost cards in this case, are for the attack, you're gonna decide if you want to defend with your hero or if you want to kind of throw your ally in front of it. And again, if you defend, you're gonna take here, exhaust that, and then subtract from the amount of attack coming at you that number. If you choose to put the, uh, you know, the, the, the ally in play, then the damage is gonna to go to them and most of the time they're just gonna die. Uh, but if you, uh, don't defend or you've already exhausted and you can't defend again if you get attacked later because you may have minions in front of you That attack you as well Then you just take that damage directly and then you mark it down here if a hero is You know knocked to zero they're out of the game and that's it and you remove their all their cards from play And if the last hero is knocked out then the players have also lost in addition to if they lose from the scheme So again, if there's any minions in play, they will also attack uh, the heroes. And so after you go all around the table, then you're gonna throw out 
a encounter card in front of each player and then resolve them. And in this case, you're gonna ignore the little boost there and then you're gonna read what this is. So in this case, this would actually put out a minion in front of me. And then maybe the next player gets this card and this actually is gonna put a new scheme into play. Or you might get here a treachery card like this. And this is just like an event that you, you do whatever it says and then you discard it. And these are just a variety of various types of harassment that the villain does to kind of thwart what you're doing. So after you've resolved all the scheming and the attacking and all the encounters, then we're gonna go back to the player turn and we just go round after round until either the villain is defeated, the scheme has been completed, or all the heroes have been eliminated and their hit points are to zero. And that's the gist of the game. So Marvel Champions, let's go through my three pillars of reviews. And the first one would be a play count. And I've played it at one, two, and four players. Um, I Okay, so I like it at all the player counts. I haven't played with three, but I played with one all the way up to four. I like all the player counts. I think for a first game, four might be a little bit much because, you know, if every, especially if everybody's first, it's gonna take a while. And that's where we get kind of into the play time. So this game kind of seems to scale up the player time based on the number of players. So just with four, it's gonna take longer. Everybody has their own little sort of form of analysis paralysis, trying to figure out what kind of combos to put together with their cards. So it's gonna increase the play time. Now I still enjoy it personally with the larger group of players because at this point I've played the game several times now. I've had a chance to use all the different heroes so I'm like, I'm kind of into it. So spoiler, I really like this game for the end of this. But I think if you're into the game, I think the player count's not gonna matter to you. So it's, it's one of those where like, to me, the player count doesn't really determine if you're gonna like the game, I imagine. So if you like the game, I imagine you're gonna get into it a little bit. You'll start to explore the characters and the villains and all that stuff. And so you'll still be like really into what other players are, do, are doing and what kind of combos they're doing because kind of the, like the diversity of the characters and their and the, the way their like asymmetry kind of works is really neat and kind of like the little thematic dressing and stuff that's kind of built into the cards is cool. So a lot of kind of cool stories and stuff are gonna kind of sort of emerge from the game. Uh, so I think that's, that to me it's engaging and interesting even on other players' turns. I'm still trying to figure out my turn, you know, even though like, you know, I might be kind of last in turn order, I'm still kind of trying to put stuff together, still interacting and discussing. But I've also played, a, you know, single player and it's awesome. It's a great solo experience. Uh, solo gaming is not something I do, you know, that much these days, you know, as I used to probably a while ago, but this has been uh, really cool. I really have enjoyed playing this solo. Uh, I'll talk more about that in the review, but I like all the player counts. The play time is gonna go up. I don't know what the box says. Solo, you're probably looking at half an hour, up to four players. You c it could take an hour and a half. Um, when I, one of the games that I played four players was everybody's first time except for me, and that took like two hours or so. Um, so it kind of ballpark, we played it a couple times, so I'm not real sure, but it, it kind of go, it can go a little bit long with four players. So if you're okay with that, I think it's still fun. It just, it just it takes longer. You have fun for longer. <laughs> okay. So that's those things. And then of course the third pillar, what is this game like? It's a lot like the Lord of the Rings living card game. It's a lot like the Arkham Horror living card game, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the idea of like, you know, cards building up threat and fighting minions and villains and monsters and all that kind of stuff on your turn, the way the villain kind of reacts, that's just like those games. I mean, it's really, really similar. Now, the thing that sets this apart mechanically is the fact that you're spending cards to pay for other cards. You don't have like resource tokens and things like that. You're not generating resources and then using them to pay for things. You're actually doing some straightforward hand management of I'm discarding this card now and it's like, ooh, this card's good, but it, you know, maybe this one gives me two resources or whatever, or this one's too expensive, so I don't want to spend all those cards. Or, you know, I'm trying to set this combo up, but this, this ally is really good. Uh, so there's some good back and forth decision making there in terms of like, what do I discard and what do I actually play? Um, and so that to me sets it apart from those games. Um, and frankly, and let's get into like kind of the juicy part of the review is that's why I like this one the best out of all of the, those kind of L cooperative LCGs that have kind of come out, um, from Fantasy Flight. And frankly, this is one of the best games 
Um, you know, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but it's one of the best games of the year, I think, that I've played. Uh, I really get into the theme of this game. Uh, the fact that you are kind of flipping between Alter Ego and Hero, that's just awesome. That works so well because you have a real mechanical decision point there because if you're in Alter Ego mode, the villain's plans are going to move forward. You're not in the front lines. You're not fighting them. You're not, you know, thwarting them. Uh, and so the scheme's going to go, but you might need to go back and recover. You might need to go back to your laboratory and tinker and work on some new equipment or make upgrades to your power suit or whatever. And then when you go into hero mode, of course, the villain, you're going to be in the villain's face and it's going to be hitting you and, and smacking you around. And that's just a cool thing. Like that's a lot of these other comic book games, like none of them have that idea which is a very important part of the comic book experience is not just fighting some weird science fiction monster all the time that's part of it but then the other side of it is their like personal life at home and how they're dealing with their alter ego and all this kind of thing and that's kind of what makes comic books really a fun read and an interesting story for people is that that's the relatable side of the comic book peter parker has to go to school still you know, Jennifer Walters has to go do her job as a lawyer. And then, um, you know, they sort of moonlight as heroes. And so that builds that into the game. And then kind of doubling down on top of that, you have the sort of baggage that you bring in and you add your own obligations to the villain deck. So your arch nemesis might show up. You, your job might call you back home or whatever. So you've got to go and do this thing to sort of maintain, you know, your cover or whatever. Just maintain your life and maintain uh, period. And so that's the cool, fun aspect to the game that just really adds this other layer that just, you know, was completely unexpected for me and just really neat. And so, and also, like I said, kind of, again, tripling down on the sort of the individuality and the character of each of these heroes is all of the decks. So again, you build like the basic cards from the hero that you have to always take, which makes sense because you've always got the Iron Man suit parts. You've got the Black Panther, uh, you know, various like little gadgets and things that, on his suit. You've got all the web slinging abilities, uh, the Captain Marvel's crazy powers, uh, the kind of the She-Hulk kind of rage aspect that can she can kind of flip and be very good against thwarting, but then flip in and just go psycho on somebody and beat them up. Um, so you've got all that kind of stuff. You've got your basic cards you're gonna mix in. And then you have this whole aspect which is sweet, like the leadership and the uh, aggression cards. So, you know, you guys, like I said about She-Hulk, like she goes crazy and kicks everybody's butt. And so you can kind of double down on that and throw more aggression cards in there and maybe that works really well. But then you can say, well, let me take a little bit more of a protective and a leadership role and kind of explore that aspect of that character in a lot of ways and kind of see how that plays out. And th this part's a little bit more of a mechanical thing for me is, that way that you can kind of plug and play those aspects really adds to what I think is should be the most important part of an LCG and that's the deck building part of it. So again, let's go back to player count. You have a solo game your character is going to naturally be better at doing certain things or they're naturally going to have a different sort of pace and a progression that they need to go through. Iron Man is the best example where you've got to slowly build up his tech upgrade cards and then he can start just wrecking face. Whereas like the Black Panther, he's a great like one-on-one -on -one combat tactician, but if you don't really if you're playing solo, if you don't really add any allies and things to kind of take some and absorb some stuff and kind of deal with some of the, the thwarting and things that maybe he not necessarily is gonna be able to deal with all by himself, you've gotta build a deck in that way for your solo game. Whereas if you're playing, let's say, with two players, then maybe you can have one character go hard combat and then another character go a little bit more leadership, a little bit more thwarting, and you know worry more about the scheme. So you've got that teamwork aspect that you're building into it. And it's interesting because even though even if you're playing solo, you're still building in teamwork because you're you know you're you're augmenting their deck in a certain way. Whereas you start to sort of stretch that out and you know thin that out across multiple characters then it's sort of a collective thing. So I can really harness in and double down on a particular aspect and take care of certain things and let Billy or whatever take the other side of things. So that's a really interesting sort of consideration is you have to approach the deck building in a different way, depending not only on the player count, but also, guess what, on the villain. 
uh, because the villains behave very differently. Ultron is a giant, huge pain in the butt. I've not yet beat Ultron on any, um, any level. I have beat the Rhino on both levels. The, in, the Rhino basic is like a cakewalk. But then once you upgrade him again, he's a little he's a little bit more difficult. It's pretty easy. And then you have Claw, which I've only beaten on like the regular mode, uh, but I haven't I haven't actually tried Claw on the hard mode. And then I <laughs> we threw Ultron in, which I think is the hardest villain. Uh, when I was playing the four player, I was like, well, let's just play against Ultron. I made an expert mode, and it was like outrageously difficult. It was so crazy. And he gets like all these like little drones. It makes you like discard cards off the top of your deck face down, and that represents. Uh, one attack, one uh, one health drone. And so if you have like four of them in front of you, there's like ping, 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 you know, they're, they're hitting you and, you know, and they're like beefing up Ultron's strength for each drone that's out, kind of depending on what schemes and stuff are out like that. So you've really got to like, again, tailor your deck to deal with certain types of things. Like Iron Man has the, um, oh, who's the fellow, the, like the other Iron Man. I can't remember the guy's name. It's the, it's the guy that's just like Iron Man, but it's not Iron Man. He's in the movies too. I can't even remember the actual name of that character. Um, I know Don Cheadle plays him in the movie, but I can't remember his freaking name. And then uh, that character will go out and do like one damage to everything, so it'll wipe out all those drones. And Black Panther's got some things where uh, Black Panther's probably my favorite character. So he'll build up like his suit, and then he plays this card Wakanda Forever, which he has multiple copies of, and you kind of want to like cycle your deck to get those out. Because when you play Wakanda Forever, and you have this all your sort of suit upgrades, you just go into like wreck everything. And so he can also like do one damage to everything in front of uh, one particular hero, because you can kind of affect other heroes and stuff and attack stuff that's in front of them. Uh, so you can kind of build you know, your decks towards the different villains which is really cool. And again, for me, that really doubles down, this is like the word of the day here, double down on the theme and the way that there is not a campaign. Because you can go, you like, each villain is its own campaign in this game. And I, I mean this honestly. If you go, you fight the villain, so you fight Ultron, you lose, you get your butt kicked. What happens in the comic book? Is it the first time the villain shows up that the heroes win? Never. <laughs> First time the villain shows up, the heroes are depressed. They're they're beat up. Maybe one of them has been. They think one of them's been killed. You know, it's just it's the worst. It's like the middle of the movie. The villain looks like you know they're just gonna snap their fingers right, and everything's gonna be dead. And and the villain, there's no way to beat the villain. But then the heroes come back. They they go back and they deck build right, and they they work together and they sort of scheme. They come up with a new plan and they go out to the villain again. Maybe it takes a second movie to get to the villain. But that's what happens here. Like you don't need some kind of like bolted on campaign stuff. I mean, you could, I'm sure they're gonna come out with scenarios and stuff that are like multi-stage things. Like you beat the first one, then you go to the second one, whatever. But this doesn't, you don't need that. You just go, we're gonna play Ultron on hard mode and by golly, we're gonna keep playing until we beat that dummy in the face. And that is a campaign because that's what happens in these comic books. And so the way that that ties into the deck building is has me actually excited to deck build. These other LCGs and stuff that I've played, uh, the cooperative ones, um, the deck building stuff was like, eh, you know, I don't know. I feel like sometimes, like one of my things with Lord of the Rings, the deck building game was I was just building the deck and then it was like, if I drew the cards in the right order, I was guaranteed to win. It's, it's almost like that thing in Pandemic where like the, the way you shuffle the deck in Pandemic, if you like have played a lot and you're good at it, it kind of tells you whether or not you're gonna win. You can just kind of peek through the deck and be like, well, we would have won or lost because I would have done this same thing every time. And so like the Lord of the Rings game and that kind of stuff, that was always kind of had that feel to me where I was like, okay, I know the exact perfect deck to beat this thing. And then I'm just gonna do that. And I was like, well, I didn't get the card off the top of my deck and I lost, but if I would have drawn differently, I would have won. And sure, there's some arguments and some discussion there that could be made about, well, how effective was your deck really? In this case though, since you're not really like, like railroaded into a story or a campaign, you can just go and play and it's like, okay, well that deck wasn't good enough or maybe we just you know got bad luck with the card draw, play it again, swap out some cards, you play it again and you just go. So to me, the marriage of the LCG with the superhero stuff and the different aspects, all the stuff I was just talking about really just sings together uh, with this particular game. So that's my review of Marvel Champions. 
100% recommend uh, anybody that is really into games. The one thing that was a little bit of a caveat, and I was a little surprised at, it's not a caveat for me, but it may be for others, is I was expecting actually a s little simpler of a game because I thought like, okay, if a kid sees this box on the shelf and they're like, I play Pokemon or, or Yu-Gi-Oh or something, and they're like, oh sweet, you know, they want to play this. So it's a little involved. Like, I'm not saying like, you know, your average 10 year old couldn't pick it up and play it. I think they could if they were really into other card games and things. Um, but it's, it's like a little bit more going on and the complexity is there. So I think the family aspect of it is, you know, I think that that's going to miss. And maybe that's not their target. I, I don't think it is. I think this is meant to be, you know, whatever, a gamer's game. And uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, I had somebody ask me actually at the shop when we were playing. He says, you know, I've got, I think he said a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. And we chatted a little bit. I was like, yeah, I think your eight, 10 year old might maybe. But uh, he was talking about some of the other games that they play a little bit. And they don't play a ton. But, um, you know, this would be like a guided experience for sure. And then once you start talking about the deck building and all that kind of stuff, of course, that's just a next level thing. So I think if you're like, oh, I'd love to play this with my kids, then just know that it's going to be involved and there is some complexity to it. And all the different heroes and stuff are. Are very different. I think you could probably use the Captain and Marvel Spider-Man characters, which are kind of like your intro characters, to get into the game. And so maybe the kids could, you know, sort of live with those characters, and then sort of graduate or whatever to the other characters that are a little bit more, a little bit more of a slow burn in terms of like you know getting their stuff going, a little bit more long-term strategy type of thing. So anyway, that's my little wrinkle I wanted to kind of throw in there uh, because 100%. I can see. You know, parents and kids wanting to get together and play this because every, everybody on the planet goes and watches MCU movies. So, all right. So definitely take a look. Huge recommend. Thanks.